The Mil Mi-8 is a medium twin turbine helicopter, originally designed by the Soviet Union, and currently still being produced by Russia. In addition to its most common role as a transport helicopter, the Mi-8 is also used as an airborne command post, armed gunship, and reconnaissance platform. Along with its export version Mil Mi-17, the Mi-8 is the world's most produced helicopters, with over 17,000 units in use on more than 50 countries. Its prototype flew on 1961 and entered mass production at the end of 1965, but the Soviet military originally showed little interest in the type entered service almost two years later, during 1967. The Mi-8 version simulated on DCS is the Mi-8 MTV-2, which can carry weapons and can also operate as a flying crane. Unlike a jet aircraft, where your engine throttle directly controls the aircraft thrust, on a helicopter you set the engine throttle to a fixed level, and then use a collective lever, to change the pitch of the blades of the main rotor, thus adjusting the thrust that the main rotor produces. Rudder pedals are used to adjust your tail rotor's propeller pitch, to provide a lateral thrust to control the yaw of the helicopter. The cyclic, is used just like a regular stick on a plane. The cyclic modifies the orientation of the main rotor, allowing you to control the pitch and roll of the helicopter. Make sure to bind the following axes to your HOTAS device, on the Controls tab of DCS Options. Flight Control Cyclic Pitch. Flight Control Cyclic Roll. Flight Control Rudder. Flight Control Collective. Corrector, Throttle Adjustment on Collective Lever. The real Mi-8 carries a crew of three or four members. Pilot Commander. Co-Pilot Navigator. Flight Engineer. Gunner. Someday, this DCS module will have multi-crew enabled and each crew position will be able to be manned by a real player. For now, you can select which crew position you want to sit on, by pressing the keys 1, 2, 3 or 4. Try it, press 2 to change to the co-pilot seat. You are now on the co-pilot navigator position. The co-pilot shares the pilot's duties and also assists the pilot with navigation duties, as most of the navigation and radios are near this seat. Check your range of movement and field of view. You can click on the Windows handle to open close it. Press 3 to change to the engineer seat. You are now on the flight engineer position. His duties include monitoring the engines, electrical system, autopilot status, and radio communications. Check your range of movement and field of view. This is the best seat to use while performing most of the cold start. Press 4 to change to the gunner position. This is the gunner position. You can use the mouse to aim the gun, left click to fire it. Check your range of movement and field of view. Press 1 to return to the pilot seat. You are now back on the pilot commander position. You can click on the windows handle to open close it. In addition to selecting your seat, you can also use the keys right shift plus P, to toggle the crew bodies visible or hidden. Try it now if you want. Press spacebar, to continue with the next training subject. To save time, in case you are repeating this mission, you can press, spacebar, to skip most voiceovers. Since in DCS aircrafts always have perfect reliability, you can be sure that all helicopter systems are fully functional. Because of this, many players never bother to perform the checks and tests that real pilots have to perform in real life, in order to save time when starting a game session. However, in case you do want to learn how these tests and checks are performed, this training mission has two versions. Press, Backspace, if you wish to learn the tests and checks in order to have a better understanding of the systems. Or, Press, Spacebar, to omit those parts of the procedure, as we know that all systems are fully functional. You have selected to skip the various tests and checks of the cold start procedure. 8.13. Pre-start checks. Please, move over to the flight engineer seat, with the 3 key. One. Enable circuit breakers. Enable the banks 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9, by clicking on them or by pressing the keys right control plus right shift plus 4 through 9. The circuit breakers at banks 1, 2 and 3 power the weapon systems, so they don't need to be enabled at start. Battery 1 and 2. Set to on, up. 
This will connect each battery to the 27 volt bus and are used both as emergency power supply and to start the engines. Six, throttle, on collective lever. Check that it is set to minimum, leftmost, using a HOTAS axis or the page down key. With the throttle turned to the full left position and the collective stick in the full down position, the engines operate at ground idle. Rotating the throttle control to the full open, clockwise, position allows the engine fuel control systems to maintain constant main rotor RPM. With full right throttle and the collective full down, the engines operate at flight idle. Note that both the pilot and the co-pilot have throttle control on their collective lever. 14. Connect external ground power. Ground power allows the pilot to operate all electric devices of the helicopter, before having the engine generators active. Even though this step is optional, we will perform it because of today's low ambient temperature, minus 12 degrees Celsius. This will allow the pilot to activate the battery heaters long before starting the engines. To contact ground crew and ask to connect ground power, press the HOTAS button that you have configured as press to talk, PTT, or use the backslash key. Press F8. Ground crew. Press F2. Ground electrical power. Press F1. On. Chief, press space on bar once the external power is connected. Copy. Power is now on. 14A. On the AC power panel, the external power on light will illuminate, indicating that the crew has connected the AC power cable. On the DC power panel, the external power on light will also illuminate, because on DCS both AC and DC ground cables are connected simultaneously. On the real aircraft they are separately connected. 14C. AC external power switch. Set to on, up, to connect the AC bus to the ground power unit. 14D. Set rectifiers switches 1, 2 and 3 to on. The 27 volt DC bus is now fed from AC power through 3 6 kilowatts rectifiers, two always active and the third is backup. 14F. Inverter switches 115 and 36 volts. Set to auto, down, with a left click. 14H. DC external power switch. Set to on, up, to connect the external power to the helicopter DC electric system. 14I. Set rectifiers 1, 2 and 3 switches to off. Their lights will not illuminate, as the DC bus is now being powered from the ground power unit. 14J. Inverter 115 volts. Set to manual, up. Normally, the 115 volt bus is powered from the generator 2 or 1. When the generators are not operative, the bus will draw power from the battery bus via the PO500 inverter. The PO500 on lamp illuminates to signal this situation. Now that we have full electrical power, let's enable heating. A. First, enable the battery's heater, by flipping the highlighted switch up. B. Next, enable the clock heater, by turning its switch up. C. Finally, enable both the left and right pitot tubes heaters. 10. Parking brake. Enable, with left shift plus W, to prevent the helicopter moving while starting its engines. 11. Rotor brake. Disengage by right clicking on it, or with the keys right control plus R. If the rotor brake is not in the full down position, a micro switch will prevent the engine start. 12. Cockpit and cabin lights. Turn on the red backlight of all the instruments and panels. The cockpit backlighting is divided into two groups, which have independent electrical supply circuits. For redundancy, the group 1 is powered by the rectifier bus. The group 2 is powered by the battery bus. 12A. Adjust the group 1 and 2 backlight rheostats for the pilot console, left overhead panels and left triangle panel. 12B. Adjust the group 1 and 2 backlight rheostats for the co-pilot console, right overhead panels and right triangle panel. 
You may want to do this from the co-pilot seat. 12C. Adjust the Group 1 and 2 backlight rheostats for the flight engineer console, center overhead panels and radio panels. You may want to do this from the flight engineer seat. 12D. The backlight of instruments added after the MI-8 was modernized to the D model, is controlled by a separate 5.5 volts system. To turn it on, first switch the 5.5 V switch to on, up, on the right triangle panel. Then, adjust the rheostat, which is located behind the co-pilot seat. 12V. You can also turn on two dome lights installed on the cockpit ceiling, on the pilot and co-pilot places. Each dome light contains two bulbs. One is white and the other is red, selectable with the highlighted switch. 19A. Service fuel pump. Set to on. This is the pump for the internal 415 liter fuel tank of the MI-8. A green service pump on light will illuminate underneath. 19B. Left and right fuel pumps. Set to on. Green left pump on and right pump on lights will illuminate underneath. These pumps are for the 1,040 liter right and 1,130 liter left external fuel tanks. Having all pumps on is not recommended for battery start on the real helicopter, but on DCS it doesn't seem to cause problems. 20. Fuel shut off valves. Lift their covers and set to open. Up. Uh, their warning lamps underneath will turn off. 20B. Please, remember to close the switch covers. start engines permission by contacting the air traffic controller of our current airbase a select radio set the radio selector to UHF on the SPU 7 panel note that both pilot and co-pilot have this panel you can use either one the UHF position corresponds to the main R863 VHF UHF command radio of the MI8 and we will use it to contact ATC Use the master knob to adjust the radio volume. B. Select preset, on the flight engineer console. The command radio can be tuned to a preset channel, or it can be tuned to a manual frequency. This time we will use the channel 16, so select preset. C. Set the command radio to AM, as on DCS the ADC always uses AM rather than FM modulation. D. Select channel 16, which is pre-programmed to the 132 MHz frequency of Sanaki's ATC. E. Contact ATC by pressing the radio PTT. Note that the communications menu states at the top which radio are we currently using, R863 on this case. Select. F5. ATC. F1. Sanaki Kolki. F3. Request startup. Press F12 to clear the communications menu. Press spacebar, once ATC has granted the clearance. The auxiliary power unit, a PU, supplies compressed air to crank the main engine compressor rotors during engine start. It can also be used as standby generator to supply 27 volts DC power to the onboard electrical systems on the ground, and in flight if the main generators fail. Do not start the engines with the APU in DC generator mode. Make sure that the standby gen switch is set to off. 1. Crank switch. Set to start, up. The APU start sequence is automated and controlled by the APD9V start control box. This switch commands it for these situations. APU ground start. APU false start. APU crank cycle. APU shutdown. 3. Press the APU start button for 2 to 3 seconds. The APU will begin its start cycle. The auto ignition enunciator will illuminate. 5. Check that the APU exhaust gas temperature does not exceed 880 degrees Celsius maximum. 7. 
monitor the nearby EGT, APU temperature gauge and air pressure gauge. Once they are stable, the auto ignition light will turn off. The stable EGT should be less than 720 degrees Celsius, and the air pressure should be within 1.2 to 2.0 kilograms per squared centimeter. The oil press normal and RPM normal lights should also have illuminated once the APU attains its normal speed. 8. 115 and 36 volts inverter switches. Set to manual, up. There are two engines, left and right. Always start the downwind engine first. This is so that the exhaust gases from the first engine don't interfere with the starting of the other engine. On this mission, the wind sock in front of us indicates that the wind is coming from the left, so we will start the right engine first. 3. Crank switch. Set to its start position, up. 4. Select the engine to start, with left-right switch. On this mission, the wind is coming from the left, so we will start the right engine first. 5. Start button. Press and hold for 2 or 3 seconds, to begin the engine start. The auto ignition light will illuminate, followed by the starter on light a few seconds later. If the auto ignition light doesn't illuminate, then most likely you forgot to release the rotor brake during the pre-start checks. 7. Once the RPM of the starting engine rises, move forward the corresponding engine stop lever overhead, to allow the fuel to reach the engine. Wait a bit, until the engine reaches idle RPM. 11. Second engine start. Follow the same procedure as with the first engine. A. APU cool down. 1 minute since the previous engine start. B. APU, EGT and air pressure. Within PPC limits. 11. C. Crank switch. Set to its start, up, position. 11. D. Engine selector switch. Set to left, as the right engine is already started. 11. E. Start button. Press and hold for 2 to 3 seconds. 11G. Fuel shutoff lever. Once the N1 RPM increases, move forward. Wait a bit, until the engine reaches idle RPM. 2. Throttle, on collective lever. Set to maximum. Use a HOTAS axis or the page up key. Engine RPM should go up, to around 85%, and the main rotor RPM, up to 93-97%. to 97%. Four generators one and two switches set to one on the AC power pan. Caution: Ensure that rotor RPM is above 88% prior to turning the generators on. If you are not using ground power, the three lights turn on rectifiers will illuminate on the DC power panel to remind you to turn on the three electric DC rectifiers. Five. Inverters 115 and 36 volts AC set to auto, down. 6. Rectifiers 1, 2 and 3, 
Set to on. Their warning lights will turn off. Seven. Flash switch. Set the annunciator lights to flash or steady, as desired. A. Contact ground crew, and tell them to disconnect ground power. Pre press F8. Ground crew. Press F2. Ground electrical power. Press F2 again. Power on. Turn Wait until the, the external power. ground power lights turns off, and then press space Copy. bar to continue. Ground power is now off. B. External power switch, on the DC power panel. Set to off. C. External power switch, on the AC power panel. Set to up. 10. Enable gyros. A. Pilot's gyro horizon. Set to on, to power the pilot's attitude indicator. Its red flag should disappear. B. Gyro cutout switch. Set to on, to enable the VK53 gyro correction system. This system reduces accumulated error during prolonged unilateral acceleration, like increasing speed, braking, and bank turns. Correction cutout does not occur from abrupt and unsustained changes in flight conditions. C. Copilot's gyro horizon. Set to on, to power the copilot's attitude indicator. Its red flag should disappear. 9. On the pilot's console. Uncage the attitude indicator by click and holding its top right button until its horizon is leveled. Its red flag will show while uncaging. Repeat on the co-pilot's console. Uncage its attitude indicator. 11. Set the tail rotor pitch limiter to off. The red off light on the center console goes out to indicate that the system is powered. This system automatically adjusts the maximum tail rotor blade pitch angle based on air density and temperature. 14. APU off button. Press and hold to deactivate the APU. Check for a decrease in EGT and a decrease in air pressure. The oil press normal and RPM normal advisory lights will go out after a few seconds. 16. Power up the avionics systems. A. Doppler switch. Set to on to enable the Doppler system used for the radar altimeter, the hover indicator and for the radio navigation. B. Com radio switch. Set to on, to enable the Yadro HF radio. D. Do not turn on the mic switch, as it will mess up the DCS radio communication. In real life is used for the crew intercommunicator. E. VHF, ADF interlock. Switch to on to enable ADF navigation. F. Press the accelerometer reset button over the pilot console to reset its previous readings. 17. Compass switch. Set to on to align the gyromagnetic compass. 19. Barometric altimeters. Set the pressure altimeter pointers to zero on both the pilot and co-pilot consoles and check that the barometric pressure display corresponds with the actual aerodrome value plus minus 1.5 mercury millimeters. For Sanaki Kolki Airbase, it is 760 mm. 20. Radar altimeter switch. Set to on, to activate the radio altimeter. The radar altimeter is now performing an initialization test, during which it will read 800 meters. 20. The test will last 60 seconds and when it finishes, a warning tone will be heard, and the low altitude warning light, on its yellow knob, will illuminate. 20. Wait a bit for the test to finish, and then press spacebar, once the knob lab turns on. 
Now, rotate the radar altimeter yellow knob, using the mouse wheel, until the green low altitude index reaches zero. The warning light will then extinguish. Press spacebar once the light goes off. Finally, you can now set the low altitude index to the desired warning altitude, say 5 to 10 meters, to activate the low altitude alarm just before touchdown. 21. Enable autopilot. Enable roll and pitch hold by clicking on the central green light. You can use the mouse wheel over the light knob to adjust its brightness. Congratulations! You have successfully finished this MI-8 realistic cold start procedure, and the helicopter is ready to taxi. Press spacebar to exit this training mission.